my PhD thesis, which I entirely wrote without asking ChatGPT and BARD, or BARD. <laughs> and it's too technical, so today I'm going to just talk fun story. Fun story through time, mostly about robots. I literally on AI, but I'll make sure that I keep the word AI very, very small throughout the talk. But yeah, hopefully. I'm Ahalya Ravindran. I'm a postdoc at the Australian Centre for Robotics, University of Sydney. And today, we'll be talking about an odyssey, phone moves to paint swords, which is basically everything that started from, which I, at least in my timeline, where robots started. So, just to give the scope, this is not that kind of an AI where I'm going to go say, hey, let's put an AI into everything that we have and make results better. It is also not the talk where I'm going to show you how to take or make pretty pictures, which could be a better talk, but that's, that's not going to be happening today. Today's talk is going to go first back way before, like 3,500 years before Christ, which is probably, no one knows what robot was back then, but we are just going to look at the perspective or like the idea behind why we think robots have become what they are now, or even AI, like how they have evolved through time. So this is what, at least personally, I found as the start. So Hephaestus is like a Greek god, and the interesting part is like how you have the whole metal working and fire and volcano together, like the same goal for everything. That's just robots, right? Aren't they? Like power supply, mechanical system, and control systems. But then there was also a myth called Pygmalion. So what, uh, so that's like the second guy. So he decided uh, to create things or like inanimate objects and put life into it. So like the idea is like there's this story where he creates a woman and then he asks the god of Aphrodite, it's like a love god, and asks the, the woman to become like, you know, life. Which is kind of cute as a story, but if it is true, it just means he created a robot. It's a myth, but if it's true. So the idea that long, long time ago, human decided to look into an inanimate object for example, say, right, like the glass bottle, and I'm like, oh, yeah, let's put life into it and see what it talks. Like, that perspective, I think that thinking is where robots actually started, or like the robotics started. So, way after, Archytas of Tarentum is all like Greek uh, history, where they started first building the mechanical bird. They call it the pigeon. Um, the idea is that Let's put a mechanical system into work and by like tweaking things, like let's make something work on its own. None of them autonomous, none of them like work on its own, but it looks like that's where the airplane started. And then Aristotle came. This is now completely philosophical. It has nothing to do with robots. But then he said, if there's some object and if that object can work on its own, we don't need people to work with that object. This makes sense. Uh, but he said it in like 322 years before Christ. There was no robots, and he was like, hey, if this glass is what is used to hold water, and if it can hold on its own, we don't need someone to pour it so that it holds, which is interesting. Uh, but now that we uh, have seen robots, for us, like the perspective is like, hey, maybe he was talking about it, but probably he was talking about something else and like it has nothing to do with it. And then 200 before Christ, uh, the water clocks were first uh, introduced. And the idea with the water clocks is that earlier before water clocks, what they had was called an hourglass. So you have like something and then like sand comes down from it and then you turn and then like sand comes from the other side and then you kind of have like a timeline. But with water clock, there is an active measure. So there is like an introduction to precision, an introduction to an activity that happens because of another activity, like a reaction. So these ideas were introduced, which collectively brought robotics into existence. 
that's my favorite roboticist, so no one is going to agree. So Leonardo da Vinci, except being an excellent artist, have come up with this idea of Leonardo's robot. So it's just the idea that he built an armor, and inside the armor he had like weights and pulleys, and then you can just like control how you head your like you know, the whole um, attire. Um, but the interesting part is that he put it on like a, a human style system. So he doesn't have to like, he, he doesn't need like, it doesn't have to be an armor. It could be like anything, like a stick or something. But he decided, hey, let's put it like in a human style. And this was, now all of these are like after, like it's like 1738 of some sort. Um, the three automotors are called uh, a man with a flute, a man with a trampoline, and a duck. And the duck system is actually an interesting one because um, the whole philosophy behind it, or like how it works, is actually the duck is designed to eat and to digest and to show like the whole system of how it happens. So none of them have nothing to do with robots, but the perspective. So like to think of a duck and then to design something so that has a system that controls by taking an input and an output is where the ideas kind of flourished. So up until then, it's like ideas that were working probably on mechanical system alone or control systems alone and computers started to come into play. So Joseph Jacquard, he invented something called an automated loom controlled by punch cards. So this is like completely like textile, has nothing to do with computers, but the idea was beautiful. He decided like, let's put a punch card and then like, we'll have some of them punched and some of them not. So depending on what kind of uh, loom design you want, so it's like kind of like introducing in logic to a system. And depending on what kind of the punch card that you have, you'll have different designs that goes inside the uh, textile machine. And then he created the punched cards, which actually played as a, a fundamental uh, backbone for creating computers. And then we all know Charles Babbage, the father of computer, though he really didn't end up building the final model of computer. Uh, he actually came up with the best ideas. So there were like two different types of engines he kind of like created. The difference engine is where he demonstrated the prototype of like the whole logic system. But the analytic engine is where he um, assumed or like modeled a general computer. So he gave this idea and he's like, hey, let's make a computer. And then he explained how it has to be done. But that is normally how invention starts. Like you always come up with an idea, you explain the idea, and then you wait for it till it, it, it gets built up. So in 1898, Nicholas Tesla, he built and demonstrated a remote controlled boat uh, at the Square Garden, but uh, it's, it's not one of his famous um, kind of invention, but he's kind of like the first person to uh, show something can be controlled remotely. And he, I think he used uh, radio frequency and uh, people were like both scared and like was okay with it. Um, but I think one of his quotes during the demonstration was that world kind of moves really slow and it's hard for us to accept the truth behind like the invention, which is nice because like it, it's from 1890 and it had been true for a long, long time till now. And then 90s came. So till up until now, there is no word called robots, but you kind of have a feeling towards how things are going forward. You have an idea where people are trying to play with mechanical systems, people are trying to play with control systems, some of them are putting them together. Uh, there is a kind of a relationship towards how they wanted to play with human style or like trying to imitate something that is there. But that's been uh, the evolution from the start of the time. And then actual robots started to come into play. So this is like, the first time we kind of know uh, where the word at least like started to appear. And it was actually from a, a, a play. 
So it's called Ariwar or Rusam's Universal Rubbers. So it was like written by a Sheg writer and then there's like a story where they're trying to create a couple of robots are there and then the robots wants to go and like replace the workforce and they want to do it because they can like, uh, like all the manual work can be taken over so people can be happy but ends up um, differently. Uh, though that's like the play story, like so the story of plot of the uh, movie and that plot had been there since the start of science fiction for robots. So in 1926, Fritz Lang's movie Metropolis came, but the interesting part about this story is because, like if you see the previous one, ah, uh, that's my bad. If you see the previous one, the robot is just like a box. But then when you introduce a person which looks actually like a person, then people started getting very interested in terms of robots and robotic development. So Maria was like the first female robot in the film, and then movies started focusing on building robots with the idea that robots can be used to replace or to use for like to like if there is like works that are like harder for you to do it manually, then robots can replace them. So Iron Turing came. Now this is where like a lot of other things are happening in the history, but he introduced the concept of theoretical computers called the Turing machines. So now like all the logics are implemented. Uh, you have like a machine that is almost the computer that we have currently. And uh, this can understand, it can take input, gives you output and can work on logics. So in 1940, which is my favorite year, Isaac Asimov came up with three laws of robotics in his science fictions. Now the zeroth law was kind of introduced later, but then the first three idea is that Let's go slowly in this slide, maybe. So it's just like a robot may not injure human being through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. So basically, let's not hurt anyone. The second one is like a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. That is just, hey, listen to what I say and then do it. But if I ask you to do harm to anyone, just don't do it. Um, and the third one is like, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or the second law, which is um, more like don't hurt yourself, don't hurt yourself um, unless you have to hurt yourself by hurting someone else or I ask you to. So those are the kind of like the first three laws that was there and then at the end of the day, um, Asimov also, in, I think like in a different story introduced um, the fact that it can't hurt anyone in like basically like don't hurt humankind at all. So that's where robots were happening. So like there is like a bloom in the film industry where they are kind of introducing the idea that they are like the robots, they can like replace work if you can make sure that they can do the same task. So this is weird, right? Because Let's say you have, a, like, you have an object and you can automate that object. You don't need a human to do some task. Like for example, like if I want the chair to move from here to there, I just can put a wheel on that chair and then like make it move. That's like an automation system. I don't want to sit and like build a robot that kind of like, you know, takes it and go and put it. But that is where like how robotics kind of started. And that is where like I, I find, it, find the perspectives interesting because we always wanted to connect to something that is like us, which is like a humanoid robot, or just robots in general. So Klaus Shannon, sorry. So Klaus Shannon, um, he, he is one of the uh, big player in AI when AI revolu revolution started. And he did develop an AI capable chess playing program but at this point, there was not enough AI, there was not enough robots, there was not enough logic even. So what he did is like, when you have the last moves in chess, so like, let's say when you say check, but not checkmate. So in, when you have like the last moves, he tried to make the check for like from where you say like check to like checkmate. So the end game is like where you have the last few moves and he have like all the content of what are the, other, what are the moves and he kind of predicted which is like the final one or like the good one. And then he started building a machine that could at the end of the day replace or like fight with human or like you know play with human and win. 
Um, and then robots like actually started coming into play like in real existence. So this is like the first robot that was able to navigate itself. So it moves on its own. There was like a lot of robots like that. It's called like Tortiff. Tor tor and the machinas specularity is like the algorithm that's like they kind of like look at. So they either use like a light sensor or like a touch sensor and depending on whether there is a window near it, it would go closer or away from it. Nowadays, these are called like emergent behaviors where they're trying to get that behavior directly from the robots, but uh, this is like way back when it started. So if you see the years like, I'm just going like years one after the other, it's not really like all of them are like very important, but I feel like this is where a lot of things happen, so I'm just like introducing all of them. Um, 1950s when Alan Turing introduced the idea, can machines think? So this is where the Turing test started. So the idea is that, um, uh, like, let's see, like, let's uh, let a robot uh, do a task, and if a human can, if a human can't decide if it is done by a robot or if it is done by another human, that is when he wins. Uh, but to understand the whole idea, you kind of have to have an understanding on what is thinking and what is intelligence, which was which didn't have a better explanation back then. So the idea was proposed but it had been in discussion for a really long time. And in 1956 is when the whole name got introduced, AI. So uh, the, the, those are like 10, most, uh, like 10 of the most famous people who actually got into, uh, got into it like when they started it. So all of their goal was to understand or to uh, learn how to intelligently uh, perform something. Like how do you do it intelligently, but also how do you do it on its own? Like, you know, like get the behavior out of it, out of the system or something like that. Um, so Joan McCarthy and Marvin Minsky are like super famous um, scientists. Uh, Marvin Minsky is like the first one to introduce um, a, a lab, like an AI lab in MIT. And Joan McCarthy later started one in Stanford, I guess. Um, and both of the labs, like, because once you have a lab, you have, like, enough research funding, and then once you have enough funding, then you start digging into ideas or, like, research gaps and figure out, like, what is happening there, like, how can I improve it, or, like, how can I introduce something? So, the MIT started with a, uh, a mechanical hand, so at that point, there's no robots, nothing is, like, given to any consumers, so, like, the ideas are there, the maths is there, the physics is there, but nothing is... Uh, like tangible or like yeah, there's nothing that you can see working. So Heinrich Ernst was like, his, his was like the first robotic arm kind of a concept. And then the idea came into industry. So the whole reason to start robotics is because you want like robots to work uh, like manual labor, so like hard work so people can be having, have like a happy life. So. The first industrial arm was introduced, and it is basically to do things that are dangerous for human to do, or like that are hard for human to do. And then Shaky and Eliza were introduced. So Shaky is like a robot that has a, it's, it's like the first robot to have like the cells of the I think it's from uh, Stanford, and Eliza is from MIT. And um, Eliza is like a natural language processing idea. That was back from 1966. So, um, so the ideas, are, so there are like different kinds of ideas that goes on robotics. Like robotics, is, robotics itself is like a bigger, uh, like a, like a bigger concept, right? Like you have like robots that moves, robots that stays, like. Even within the robots that moves, there are like soft robots. There are like so the soft robot is where this is introduced. So Jap uh, in Japan, like they they introduced like the the whole soft robotics was introduced back from Japan, and then uh, there is a whole flexible object manipulation, which currently is done by using a robotic arm, where you instead of like providing a a, a coordinate to like some go and like grab something. You just like let it understand what the object's shape is, and then you like try to pick it. But it started back in 1976 in Japan, and 1977 happened, and Star Wars happened. 
So till then, no, none of, I don't know whether you guys knew about it. I had no idea what a robot was. I had no idea what a Star Wars was like till like two years back, but um, we introduced, uh, the Star Wars, they introduced like both R2D2 and C3P, uh, C3PO. So uh, those were like, I think, um, it's just not two robots, right? I think like most of the films kind of introduced the whole idea to us. Um, but you, got the, you get the gist. So you know, like you kind of have an expectation on how robots has to work or like how robots are existing. And then you have like a certain behavior you kind of expect it to demonstrate. And then deep space exploration happens. So all of these are happening at the same time. But also you can see like how, how, how you can like kind of relate to it. Like you are in like, let's say you are in like 1977 and you know like there's Voyager 1 and 2 is like being launched and it's going out to a place where like there's no stars uh, gravitation anymore, and then you are here, and then you're like, okay, let's build robots, it's easier. I mean, you can do that, like I can't do that, right? So it does make sense. And then in 1986, the Lego Group and MIT Media Lab started doing educational robots. So that, that, that's also like a bigger thing because they kind of got a bigger audience to get interested in robots, probably like kids, but once you have enough um, uh, information to provide to someone, to get them interested, then it's easier for you to build a group which is interested in it. And then Honda said, let's create a research program and then we perform, uh, it's called like cobots, so it's like collaborative robots. So instead of just human doing something, let's have a friend who do something with us. So it's like, let's build more humanoids. So if you can see like the Honda's attempt from 1986 till today, but the idea is like the first one is probably let's go into the industry, like the workspace, and try to pick something. So now we go from, uh, because the topic was supposed to be like porn moves, I wanted to like talk about a couple of chess to make sure that staying on the topic. So Deep Thought was like one of the first or initial chess, chess players program. It did defeat a grandmaster, uh, but it didn't defeat all of them. And then this was like the first attempt to uh, play chess. And then once they had it, they were like, let's keep going. Uh, Dante was an interesting one because they actually demonstrate putting a robo in a place where it is really hard for human to enter. People will be dying. And then they were like, okay, let's put Dante. And then they made like, they had enough um, uh, information or like data so that that can be interpreted to understand the environment. And in 1996, big companies started to uh, play with robots. So Honda said, we'll release P3. P3 is like uh, their decade long research program. So you saw like earlier, they were like working on different kinds of robots and they were like, okay, maybe we can put this guy inside the home and he looks okay. And then IBM said, uh, IBM, uh, they were playing uh, Deep Thought that I showed you earlier and they built something called Deep Blue, which actually defeated Gary Kasparov, who was like the grandmaster back then, uh, in a six game match. And robots were better at chess than human beings. So then it went to robotic arm in space. So I think Canadian agency for the first time, they introduced a robotic arm. So like when you try to put like the ISS station, you have to like open and like kind of close it. So normally you, uh, when you do, when an astronaut kind of do it, it's like it's not safe for him, depending on how the space is, like what other things are entering. But if you put a robotic arm, it's like not a problem. It's, a, it's, it's like it damages, you build it again. And then the Pathfinder mission to land on Mars. 1999 was cute because they said, okay, let's put dogs. Because like, all this time they were like, Oh, let's put, uh, why do I keep doing that? It has like the bigger button, I can't help it. Um, so, uh, the, like all this time they were like, let's put like work on human. And then in 1999 they went and be like, huh, we'll think about dogs. I mean, if I was like a roboticist back then, right? I'd be like, let's think about dogs first and then maybe human, because human is like complicated. It's like, and also too expensive to build, it's too much. Uh, but yeah, uh, Ibo was like, they had like different versions. So as again, you can see like how it started, like probably like a very cute toy. 
to like an actual looking verbal. Um, but uh, it wasn't a very, uh, a very successful product though. Um, and the reason being like, it's, uh, it's the purpose, right? Like uh, there were enough social rebels for tasks like giving care for elders and giving care for care in like uh, hospital, hospitals. But this was just for having fun at home and people weren't very happy with uh, having robots at home, at least back then. So in 2000, uh, different ideas started coming into existence. So Honda said, hey, we have a really cool looking robot. And uh, Kismet was like a robot that where emotional intelligence kind of got introduced. So they were like, okay, you're happy. Let me reassure that with a face. Now, you see how it changes, right? I'm just like, oh, let's pick something. Like, let's move something. Let's take something. And now they're like, yeah, I want to feel it. Like, let's put some emotions onto the face. So once you probably put like a nice skin to it, it will look like a very cute rubber. But this is what goes inside. So just like, you know, how the actuators and the motors work, basically. Um, and then in 2002, they were like, okay, it's time. We have been talking about like putting robots into homes like for a long, long time. Let's put one. And they ended up putting actually something that cleans the house and all this research just to have make a friend. But Roomba had been there for a long time. And most of the people, I can't say most of the people, people who are interested in robots do have like a Roomba at home and it just cleans and that's their job. Uh, there had been research on like putting a camera to it and making it like building it like to an extent But it's all just like a platform based research So now we are in 2003 and NASA launches uh, Spirit and opportunity NASA had been like putting a lot of robots outside. We have like a slide probably somewhere there and Then Boston started coming with big dog. So big dog is like um, One of like what so they also have like a lot of lo uh, There's another slide so uh, uh, Boston also has like uh, a lot of robots, but mostly they focus on animal oriented. Um, and NASA focuses on, hey, space oriented. But these two are like super big companies that has uh, been working on robots for a quite a long time. So in 2005, self-driving cars got introduced. Now this is like where they have like something called the DARPA Grand Challenge. So this happens like every year. Uh, I can't be, I can't, I guess last year or the year before, uh, Australia won, or oh, like they got second, but the position was really high with like wildcat slam algorithm. Uh, but the idea is like, they put you, they let you drive like self-driving. So this is where the self-driving cars actually got introduced. But the idea is let's make a dr car drive on its own. And actually Australia, uh, ACFR also participated in the competition and uh, nowadays, it's like, let's put multiple robots and then see if they can communicate and go through like a mining industry, like a, a mining cave or something like that and like uh, retrieve objects. But the idea was there. It wasn't good, but it was there. And then it had been improved ever since. So 2005 to 2012, really nothing happened, like small changes, like incremental updates. And in 2012, they said, uh, that was like an image net. Uh, so now it's like AI is getting introduced. People have started working on it. And then uh, ImageNet had a challenge. ImageNet challenge is like where you have like a lot of, uh, lot of like uh, images and you kind of have to figure out what image is what. And a team said, okay, we have something that works, but we also have enough computation. So let's make it deeper and then like make it like complex as possible. And they also had like really nice tricks um, but then we built it and then they came up with AlexNet and that is where the whole computer vision kind of took a turn and from then it had been mostly computer vision focused robotics and that is because computer vision uh, kind of introduced a very precise result for robotics. So in 2016, because we play with games, we said, okay, chess is good, now let's go for AlphaGo. AlphaGo is like another game and then you know that reaction, so a robot one. And then 2017 happened. So this is actually a Google paper, but uh, they introduced the idea called a transformers. 
and they said attention is all you need and that was it was like a milestone like AlexNet where like things so the difference between like AlexNet and Transformers is that with AlexNet like in, at least in terms of robotics computer vision got like introduced like most people started working on computer vision whereas with attention is all you need you don't really have to change the input architecture which means you can put like different kind of sensors like touch sensor and the uh, and, uh, image sensor and audio and you can put all of them through the input like without any like major changes. So it's just like kind of good because robots have a lot of sensors and a lot of information. So there were like all the other robots. So Alpha Zero is like um, an update from uh, the deep blue, deep, deep, deep thought to deep blue. And then they were like, okay, superhuman performance in chess, so Shogi and Go are like two other games. So now basically all the board games, robots are good at it. And then the Boston Dynamics said, we'll put a new robo. And that's like Atlas. So you probably have seen enough videos of Atlas, like trying to carry things and like trying to play with it. It's just like, um, at least like at the start, they didn't use AI. So it's all of them were like um, control algorithms, which was like really cool. Now also it's like cool, it's like now they use AI, but like most of them are unsupervised. So it expects, understands the environment and try to come up with its own behavior, which is really cool. Um, in 2019, GPT start, uh, so it's basically like large language models. So you see like how uh, in robots, like we introduced like to the computer vision idea, and then once transformers comes, all the other sensors come into play. And once GPT started got introduced, large language models come into play. So you don't really need to talk to a robo. You mean like you talk to a robo in maths, but you can actually talk to a robo in English uh, or any language if you want to put it in a home. Because like you don't want to program it to like go grab an apple and then go and sit down and ask it to program again to go and grab an orange. You just want it to say, hey, I want apple and orange. So this started leveraging the GPT ideas, so the large language model ideas, and with ear, it started improving. So at least till before pandemic, the AI research was there, but it wasn't as uh, fast or cool as uh, what happened after pandemic. So with OpenAI having GPT-3 and Boston introduced something called Spot, so Spot is the, the middle one. Uh, the idea was there like a couple of years ago, but they started putting in arm manipulator on it and other sensors on it and it started uh, working on its own. So it's basically putting an unsupervised learning there and then asking it to do things. So they were not trained to open the doors like that, but then once you train it to like a couple of manipulation techniques, and then when you ask it to do something new, it will understand the environment and decide, okay, how, from how do I go from what I've been trained to how, how I'm going to like kind of like generalize it to a, to a task. AlphaFold, it's not really robotics, but, uh, it could be robotics. Uh, it was like the uh, bigger breakthrough with medical, and there is like a kind of like a group of robots, uh, robot roboticists who work on medical related robots, like surgical robots, and robots which focuses on medical imaging. So they had a breakthrough there. And in 2021, the self driving cars kind of came into, uh, uh, I would say, reality. Uh, in I think in uh, California, you currently have robot, like cars where you can just go and be like, I want to go somewhere in a self-driving car and then the self-driving car takes you. Uh, in Australia, we have regulations. So uh, like in our uni, we have like a self-driving car, but we are not allowed to take it like in a specific, or we are only allowed to take it in like specific roads. It's like, it comes with like enough regulations so you don't hurt people. The other two research that kind of goes there, the top ones are like, uh, it's called like, in technically it's like segmentations and then like improving the safety. So like uh, if there is like a sudden break, if there's like suddenly someone is entering, how do you do it? So the research is still going, but the, and, and a minimal product, if, is, it, is, it, is, there, is there a minimal product? Yes, if there is one, but depending on how uh, the countries are too, right? Like some, some like we, there, like, there are like different data sets that you kind of train on. And for example, like an India data set is like super hard to train with because there's like a lot of information that's going on and like the streets are sometimes like really small and then there's like Canada and then there's like all snow and it's like, so it's, there is like a minimal product for a minimal climate, for a minimal city, 
but it keeps changing depending on how you have the, uh, how, how it changes with the country. And in 2022, that's like my favorite. So that's actually a Google product. Uh, but uh, the idea is that do as I can, not as I say. And what they do is like they have this robot and then they train it on like one kitchen in Mountain View, uh, California. And then they take the robot to another kitchen. And what they say is like, they don't explain it what they want. They just say like, hey, I'm thirsty. And then the robot decides, okay, this person is thirsty. Maybe we have to go and get some drink. And it goes and gets a drink uh, instead of just getting a, let's say, a food. And how it works is like you can see like on the side there is like a score system. So it kind of predicts what kind of an output the user wants it. And depending on what kind of uh, an output that, that the user would expect, it gives like a higher score. And it keeps changing depending on what happens. So if you, let's say, it, it grabs the drink, but it spills the drink, and it sees that it spills the drink, so it understands how to go and get a sponge which is what is happening. So the other two are like the, that's the year I think for the first time an AI cover was like introduced for the magazine, which was really cool. And then we started understanding things on our own, uh, in a poem way or in just, I don't know. Uh, I really understood quantum theory with that. So yeah. And then we are in 2023, which is this year, and there had been so many advancements. A couple is like Adobe uh, released its Firefly. I think they also introduced a couple more uh, photo editing related stuff. Uh, I'm just going to make that picture pretty because it has like way to create better pictures. The second one is like from Midjourney. Uh, they also introduced Nerf actually back in 2020, but now it had been like, so the, the one that you see here is actually not a video but like multiple images that are put together. And this is how, um, if you remember the previous talk, and they were talking about like how they're going to create the map. But the idea behind creating a map comes from NERF. And this is how it's, uh, it's like at least the current state of the art is going on. So those are the, the two big, not, yeah, those two big uh, robotic companies and their timeline is like. So how they started with Big Dog and how it is Spot Mini with an arm now. And it's just like you can see like they have focused on it and then there's like different, so they have like two different kinds of humanoid style, uh, which is Batman and Atlas. So now there's like always Atlas. And then they decided on like, okay, let's go for a dog style. And then go, they got Spot, Spot Mini and Spot Mini plus arm. Uh, Wildcat is normally what is used for, uh, uh, let's say um, mining or like, uh, things where things get like, it's, it's harder to uh, perform operations. And then there is NASA, and they put a helicopter actually in Mars, which was actually only have to do like a one attempt, like just like fly and come back and like stay, but they were so cool, and they, keep, they were able to update it from here, and they, it had, I think it's like it's in the 50 second mission or something, so yeah. So going forward, there are like actually a lot of things in robots like not has not been explored at all, which is like kilobot. Like it's like multiple robots. So it's called swarm robotics, where you have multiple robots and you give a shape and it kind of like forms its own shape. The second one is actually one is a robot, one is a person, if you can find which is which. But the person is like, hey, hey, let's make a robot which looks like me. It's actually a professor in Japan. And then the third one is uh, dancing with robots where like, they try to be like collaborative, but in like in very artistic form. Um, and octopus inspired robots is like, where normally like earlier they had like these manipulators where they put like metal objects, but now they are like very flexible, let's grab anything. There's like currently some research going on in Berkeley where they are doing like, uh, taking like noodles and then trying to feed it to like a patient. But it's really hard because noodles like you just take it and then like, <laughs> But, but they can do it, like, so it's like, there is research there. And then the caring robots is like, more like social robots and like something that is very pleasing. So, to go from here to actually putting it into uh, houses, there had been like AI and like robotic regu regulations. It's been there for a long time, it's like kind of like a slow progress, but there is like definitely things are there. Uh, I think Europe has started taking it like uh, really uh, seriously right now and it's a step, right? It comes. Um, and 
because the topic was supposed to say about pain swirls, which, which has a lot of uh, uh, to, which has a lot of uh, avenues for robotics. I guess like you don't you don't have enough data to train in robots uh, because like there's no enough robots to like ha like have the data. Um, so generative AI is cool because you can like create data, uh, but when you started, you we were expecting generative AI to create images like Lisa in a tutor, right? But it actually started creating real images. Like the model is really good. So the regulation has to be there because now things are getting really serious and you don't want to uh, go against ethics or like anything of that sort. Um, so yeah, that was just like a talk on a timeline for robots, but that's just like my timeline, right? Like. That I like, I, I just like Google, okay, what's the timeline I want to talk about? And then I, this came up. And most of the talks, I think like most of this is like what is like already discussed. There's like Alexa and like the ones uh, kind of a robo. There's also a chatbot. So I don't know. It depends on like perspectives, I guess. But yeah, that was supposed to be the talk. Thank you. Any questions? Did you guys like not understand at all, or like it was fun? <laughs> Sounds like it's the first. Are they doing any um, work on um, robots for agriculture? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so like uh, even like ACFR, right? ACFR has already have like a robot that they do for uh, agriculture. So it depends on like. Uh, what kind of the crops that they are working on. I think there's like there's one that is implemented in Australia uh, where the robot goes uh, and uh, it's like there's like a, a couple. So one is like orchid, or, 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 orchid farm, one where they do like the apple picking and like the fruit, pick, fruit, fruit picking. I personally work on a, um, or, but this is like related to New Zealand, but like on a forestry where you fly the drone and then you capture data and then you make sure that how, what's the model of the trees that looks like in the forest? And then you kind of map, you kind of give that information to like the people who works on genetics and they figure out um, how, what kind of a tree you kind of have to um, uh, put it in forest so you can get more oxygen and less carbon dioxide so like, the, the, like you can improve the climate. So depending on what kind of research you do, but there is research on climate research, forest monitoring, agriculture, and uh, health monitoring of like plants. Like even here itself. Yeah, I think that they're, they're doing, Sydney University's got a project that they're doing some agricultural robots for uh, sheep farms and it's also uh, growing vegetables and that sort of stuff or pruning or, or weeding a, a vegetable yeah. plant. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of talk about um, robots getting um, emotions, um, particularly with AI. Okay. Um, what, what are your views on the development of emotions within um, robots and whatever, um, and the taking over of the world by robots? Um, yeah. We are here, right? <laughs> And we will be here. So if we're taking over the world, it means like it has to go above us. Like, and we are here to regulate. So we hope like we understand, okay, they're not going to behave well. We'll put something in like stop it. But yeah, I think it's just like um, every technology has to start somewhere. And when it starts, it won't be as good as it, it will be when it's like in, in, in few years. But that's not going to stop us from having technologies. But having said that, there are like a lot of technologies that have been stopped, like cloning. I think like human cloning is like not done anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on the regulation bodies and countries, and depending on how good the system becomes. Uh, like we will be in good hands. Because there was a report on Sixty Minutes about three three weeks ago, um, where a report was with the robot, mm -hmm. um, and it's the robot that's starting to show emotions, um, the, the technology is actually there for, for having emotions? Or, or 
So the understanding about emotions is like, there are like a couple of different kinds of research that have been done. So if it is like a, a, a vision-based uh, emotion, emotion, right? A vision-based emotions, um, it's just like it understands how someone is like reacting. And then uh, because you have like unsupervised learning and then you have like a specific behaviors that normally human demonstrate when they have a specific emotion, they can understand what is going on. Uh, there is also researchers related to emergent behaviors where robots are, uh, robots, uh, are ex they are expected to understand and behave on their own. And they all come together, but at the end of the day, there is always like laws that you can follow and then you can have, like, keep it at the base. I have a degree in AI, I have master and I work in an IT field. It's so weird for me why the AI don't do programming because as far as I know it must be very easy for them. Do you have now about any boundary stop AI do the programming job? I mean like ChatGPT do it already, right? I've been like playing with it yesterday. <laughs> me and ChatGPT are like co collaborating on coding. <laughs> Uh, I use ChatGPT for collaborating and coding, but I'm waiting for a day that they take us, they do the whole job by themselves. Yeah. So <laughs> do you think it's so close? How many time do we have? When should I start for searching new job? <laughs> well, you don't have to search for new job because we as human, we always find a gap and then like get a job that like kind of like almost need to do. Um, in terms of uh, how long it has, like, I think like for, like emerge, like you're working, right? So your product manager has to come and tell you, like this is how we want something. And it has to be so clear for you to understand what he, the person is saying for you to program it. How good we are to explain that to a, 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 a like let's say an NLP system, like an LLM system. I think that is where the gap is. Like you want something and then you are able to express it but how well you can express it to the um, uh, uh, LLM model or a robo or an AI system for it to uh, kind of do the task. I think once you can bridge that gap, you'll be able to program it on its own. So like for example, right? So I asked uh, uh, ChatGPT yesterday, there was this function and I wanted to like make sure that there's no syntax error. So I was like, throw the syntax, er syntax error away and then send me the, like, the, like, you know, give me the code back. It just gave me the code back. But if I didn't know what a syntax error is, I would have asked it like, is this correct? Can you help me? And it would be like, it is not correct. You can use this. And there are like functions where you can use it and it will like start explaining it to me. So I think that's the gap. Like if you can explain it in the right way, in a way that like the LLM can understand, then you, you're good. Having said that, actually, remember the, uh, the video I showed you about the cork spilling? So they have something called a robotic affordances. So robotic affordances is like a, 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 a barrier between actual uh, language model and for robots. And you kind of uh, explain it in a way. So you, uh, like, if you want to grab it, normally you say X, Y, Z, and then like, you have like, a, a, like a, a model that goes in where you tell it to like, grab it. But the robotic affordances is where you actually say it in English and then say, look at the task, like, and then like, you know, try to grab it kind of a concept. So if you can, come up with something that is similar to robotic affordances or for programming, that's another way. But those are like research gaps, which human can do. Mm -hmm.